<laughs> and uh, he's specializing in full stars and uh, neutron stars and binary systems. So he'll tell us something about that maybe today, about the orchestra and what, how the universe plays into our ears, basically. So, okay. Good. Uh, sorry for the delays since technology was not very compliant for us uh, today. Um, right, so uh, it's a pleasure to be back after, uh, I don't know when I last gave a talk at Astrosoft uh, some time ago, and I'm just back from paternity leave actually, so I was away most of the academic year, so um, I think, uh, is it any first year students here, or, yeah, all, all mostly, okay, yeah, a couple ones, so you would not have met me before, uh, but the other ones you might have got uh, me as a lecturer in a, in the intro to data science course or something else. I don't know what I'm going to teach. I'll teach radiative processes, and then um, for next year it's moving year, so it's, it's, it's going to be a gap one year. Anyway, uh, so yeah, so I, I prepared this talk for Blue Dot uh, of last year, um, and uh, so it's all about like the sounds of space. Uh, and obviously, you're a physicist, so you probably are familiar with that. Um, so the, the um, the waves, right? So you do full courses about waves. Um, no sound propagates through uh, space because it's empty, right? And um, so actual sound that we hear with our ears um, are nothing else than just compression of air, right? And that then makes vibrate the various you know bits in our ears, and our brain interprets it, and you know we can listen to music and whatnot. So sound waves are longitudinal waves, right? Which means that you have essentially a zone where the, uh, the air is less dense and then becomes more dense and less dense, etc. And the, this pattern is obviously quite regular uh, for like a, uh, a, a specific tone, right? And uh, it's got some wavelength or frequency. And so if you stand in one specific spot in, in space, then over time, the pattern of compression will move across you and you'll be able to you know, register with your ear uh, the, you know, the, the tone. And then if you have music and whatnot, that will be a superposition of multiple sine waves or whatnot, where the amplitude varies and the, ver the, com the mixture of frequencies vary. Um, <clears throat> light does propagate in vacuum, obviously. We see stars and they are you know, far away and there's the the sort of vacuum of interstellar space in between. And that's because it's an oscillation of the electric and magnetic field, in which can vary uh, in vacuum, right? So you, you, don't need a, you don't need a support, so to speak, for a magnetic field to, to span across space. It can just be there, same for electric fields. The main difference compared to sound as well is that uh, light is a transverse wave. So you can think of the oscillation taking place uh, perpendicular to the trajectory of motion. Um, so, um, and that transverse waves is more similar to, for instance, guitar strings. When you play, you know, you play guitar or, or piano even. So you, uh, you know, you, you, you strike it and the wave traveling in the, in the guitar is not the, the actual string that gets like thicker, or not thicker, but more dense and less dense in places, but rather it is a motion up and down or, or sideways that you know, carries the, the information. <clears throat> so these are transverse waves. Now, in astrophysics in general, as you will see during the talk, there are all kinds of waves. So obviously the sound, you know, the, 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 the sounds of space or the cosmic orchestra, obviously we're not, I mean, for most of it, you'll see it's interpreted sounds right that we make out of astrophysical signals because the actual sound we can't we literally can't hear it because it cannot propagate to us um, so in some cases it's an actual process that produces waves that then we you know essentially transform into sound in some other cases it's like other physics that can actually be quite nicely visualized if you want or or um, or transform into a sound okay so there will be a mixture of these um, so I'll start um, with like one easy example, our sun, right? So that's sort of closest star to us. Uh, 
the sun, well, there was an eclipse just recently as well, so uh, I'm not sure how many of you have watched uh, the eclipse live or seen pictures, but um, it was actually a really cool eclipse, right? Because there was a hybrid eclipse. <laughs> and I must say, uh, not you know, all astrophysicists are good sort of amateur astronomers, if that makes sense. Like, um, you know, my, what, my wife is also an astronomer, and, you know, she always mixes up the order of the planets kind of thing. You know, I make, oh, not quite, but, you know, I make fun of her. Because she, you know, she was not like a stargazer and all, you know, doing these things. I mean, she's a great astrophysicist. But, you know, uh, the sort of stuff that an amateur astronomer might do, like, you know, she's not necessarily good at. I mean, it's the same for, like, Lewis Hamilton, even though, you know, he's a, you know, amazing driver, maybe the best in history or whatever. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that he can change, like, the brake pads on his car, if that makes sense. Even though he drives a car, it doesn't mean that, you know, he knows everything about cars. Um, so, but they, they, that eclipse, actually, I've learned something I didn't know about hybrid eclipses. Who, I mean, who knows that here, who, who is aware that this eclipse was an hybrid eclipse? Not many, okay. And who has ever heard about a, a, an hybrid eclipse? Right? I think you've all done, or maybe a bar a few, uh, you've kind of done like, you know, Astro 101 kind of thing. You know what an eclipse is, right? The solar eclipse, right? So the moon passes between the, the sun and us. And you, what you probably know is that there are three eclipses, types of eclipse, right? So there's the, the total eclipse, right? So uh, where basically the moon passes, and it's big enough, it's projected in the sky to hide the sun entirely, basically, and the sun disappears entirely. Then you have the, uh, the partial eclipse, where the alignment is not quite right, and then you only see part of the sun being occultated, right? And usually, if there's a total eclipse somewhere on Earth, if you move away from the, what we call the eclipse corridor, or the, to the total nest corridor, you'll get the partial eclipse, because the actual Alignment is spans something about like um, 300 or 500 kilometers or so, I think, on the on the ground. But if you move away, you see partial eclipse. Uh, and then there's this other thing called the annular eclipse, where uh, you know because the orbit of the moon is not a perfect circle, but it's actually an ellipse. Sometimes the moon is further, and sometimes it's a bit closer. And so as a result, when it's actually furthest, the projected size of the moon is just small enough, in fact, that it can fit entirely in the sun, and you see a ring of the sun during the, what would be, otherwise be the totality. Um, what I didn't know is that you can get both an annular and total eclipse during the same eclipse, which is really amazing. So basically, if you have the moon just at the right position, on parts of the, of the, the ground, the, like you're close enough that you get the total eclipse, but then further in the path, because of the curvature of the Earth, and also because of the motion of the Moon during the eclipse, the, the projected size of the, of the Moon might actually just get a tiny bit smaller, and then you get an a, a, a annular eclipse. Um, so apparently like this happened. So I think it, like Indonesia, they had a, a total eclipse, and I think some places, maybe Australia, I want to say, uh, they saw an annular eclipse. So pretty neat, I didn't know it even existed. Anyway, sorry for the tangent, um, but yeah, so the sun, uh, I mean, what we typically think of the sun is the, what we call the photosphere, so where the, 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 uh, the, uh, most of the optical photons leave, and it's a region of, you know, that makes the, the sun looks more or less like a sphere, but obviously if you hide it, I mean, you can see it on the image, it's like this sort of fuzzy, you know, hair around, and that's like the, the part of the corona or chromosphere of the sun, and that's like, you know, really high temperature plasma, and it tends to be quite faint, so you don't see it with the naked eye, and you only see it during a uh, total eclipse. But also when you go to other wavelengths, like uh, you know, UV or, um, or X-rays, this tends to be actually very bright because, the, because it's high temperature gas. <clears throat> um, so if you kind of zoom in on the sun, you'll see it's all bubbling. You can sit on the image, and uh, you, you, you would hear it probably a bit like this, if you could transform that into a sound. So imagine, and we, uh, you know, using the light we get and measuring um, uh, with solar telescopes, we can actually do, you know, uh, uh, spatially resolved images of the sun. Obviously, not too difficult. It's quite big. Um, and if you um, if you turn the 
um, if you do um, spectroscopy on, on that image, you know, in 2D, like spatially resolved spectroscopy, you can measure the, the, the velocity of the gas. So you can try to track, say, a, a particular line, say H alpha, right, Balmer alpha, and then you can measure the velocity of H alpha on different spots of the star. And what you, you see is that, yeah, what you have by these granules, I think they're called, um, <clears throat> these sort of like, you know, spots, then you have gas that goes up in some other places, the gas goes down. And so you can essentially take that and this, this pattern basically produces some kind of a hump, which is basically kind of, um, <clears throat> Um, you know, essentially some sort of white noise, but you can uh, you can then tweak it, right? You can you can look in like a different wavelengths and such, and to uh, to get different uh, patterns on the on the sun's surface. Um, so there was also a mission called SOHO some time ago, and then there were uh, which was two uh, uh, satellites that took uh, 3D images of the sun, and there's other ones. And so sometimes you might you know if you kind of Google uh, sound, you know, sound of from the sun or whatever, you might hear things like um, the, uh, these big loops, these uh, 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 protrudence or some, uh, I forgot the English word for it, um, you know, these big arcs, um, and sometimes you have flares, so these are sometimes imaged as well. And the sun itself has the, you know, what we call the solar wind, which is basically, you know, ionized particles accelerated going out and uh, these produce, uh, produce the auras, right, on, on Earth. Uh, so that solar wind as well, like gets to the Earth, and uh, and you can measure essentially, you know, with some kind of a pressure detector. Say if you want, you can measure the pressure of that solar wind, and you can turn it as well into a sound if you want. So there's all sorts of ways that one can image the sun, uh, but um, but in a way, uh, doing that, you know, is it, it, also telling us a lot about the processes, right? Because these these bubbles, they have a typical size and they're connected to like the internal structure and the temperature of the sun and what the processes that are going on. Um, so the, the typical bubbles, they're connected to what we call micro turbulence on, on, the, on the surface of the star. And uh, when you do stellar astrophysics, like at really you know, high resolution spectroscopy, for instance, uh, it's something that in the models you can tweak uh, and you, you, can, you can make it, so I think in the sun it's, like these bubbles, the velocities are a, a few kilometers per second in velocity. Um, but some stars have lower turbulence values and some have higher values. And uh, when you tweak that, you can actually change a bit the, the spectral lines in the object. So you can learn, you can learn from that quite a lot. Um, <clears throat> in other stars, in fact, the sun included, except the sun it's not quite, it's, it's a lot messier, but in, in a, a big, uh, 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 in many classes of stars, which we call uh, per, uh, periodic and also there are uh, non-periodic variables, the star might pulsate. Uh, so here's an example. Um, <clears throat> so this star, it is uh, it's called HD31901. You can see it's the one on the, on the image with a little uh, circle around it. Uh, and it's, well, uh, so it's a, it's a star called a, a Delta Scuti. Um, so there's various classes of periodic variables. Um, you, you're probably familiar maybe with the Cepheids. Um, uh, there's, there's probably, I don't know how many different ones, but I could probably name probably uh, at least four, if not five or six, you know, types of periodic variables. R, Lyrae, Cepheids, Delta Scuti, mirror variables, um, and you know, so on and so forth. <clears throat> so uh, often stars pulsate, and that's usually connected to a specific stage of their lives. Uh, so when you look in the uh, color magnitude diagram, the stars that pulsate, they're usually all around the same area or a strip, uh, which often even we call the instability strip. So for the Cephids and also like these uh, Delta Scotti and also the, the R Lares, the different types of variables because they're in different regions of the HR diagram, but the underlying mechanism tend to be the same. So uh, it's it's something that we refer to as the uh, the kappa mechanism or the um, the Eddington valve. So the idea is that in a in a gas, normally if you take a gas and you heat it up uh, and you compress it, 
the opacity of the gas will, will decrease, you know, the optical depth or, uh, or the, the mean free path, if you want. So, so in a star, if the gas gets compressed, it gets more uh, like essentially um, you know, hotter, right? Mm. Ideal gas. Uh, therefore, photons can go through more easily, and therefore it reduces the amount of energy, right? That's trapped in that gas, and therefore the gas should cool down, and therefore it expands. So there's kind of like this sort of self-regulating mechanism in stars, which makes them normally in like equilibrium, and they're quite happy like that. But during a phase of their evolution, some of the stars might develop a, a layer where it contains you know, certain types of heavier elements, or even low, low uh, like hydrogen, but hydrogen that can be in the uh, H minus state. Okay, so, uh, so where it's got two electrons. Um, and when it happens, um, under specific conditions, a gas might become a non-standard you know, gas, which normally at higher temperature should become more, uh, more um, you know, lower absor uh, absorption. So, and it behaves the other way around, basically. So if you heat up the gas, it becomes more opaque. So in which case, if you have a layer like that in, in, in the star, you, uh, you have photons going through, it heats up the gas, right? Collides and everything. Heats up the gas. The gas expands, but also gets warmer, right? And then, by doing so, it absorbs more. So you would think like it becomes, you know, a, a degenerate, uh, degenerate process, and it would just run away. Thankfully, some other things happen because the gas that's underneath that's lost the energy will normally contract because it's lost, you know, energy. So therefore, that top layer will tend to kind of like sink in. And, and take the space you know that's been left behind, and so that layer would eventually start um, start expanding and and then cool down, and then the, then the the light will manage to make its way through basically. So uh, it becomes a bit like a valve basically because you have like this layer that is quite opaque, you know, and then compresses and expands and compresses and expands, and each time it does that, it blocks more or less. Uh, photons and he therefore heat or energy to go out. So the star itself will pulsate, so it can literally expand, uh, also will change in you know, luminosity as, as a result. Um, so that's how like a lot of the stars pulsate. It's not the only mechanism, but it's it's one of the main ones. Um, so uh, and and in some cases it's quite a, a periodic pattern, but sometimes it can be quite more er erratic. Um, so, and when they pulsate also, they pulsate just like musical instruments, like a, 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 a tambourine or a drum. Right? So if you have a drum right, and you hit it, you'll, and you hit it in different ways, you can even produce different like, uh, tones or, or sounds, mm -hmm. depending on what modes you excite. Right? So I assume most of you are physicists here, but uh, maybe not everyone. So uh, if, if you have like, you know, a, a, like a guitar again, right? And you you uh, you flick it, right? It will vibrate, and but only vibrations where the wavelength is like a multiple of the, the length, right? An exact multiple of the length are permitted. On a drum, right? It's the same except that you know it's not just like a single sort of sine wave, but it's a it's a spherical harmonic, right? And uh, and then uh, on a star, it's literally spherical harmonics, and so stars can beat. You know, at the fundamental, where basically the entire star expands and contracts, but also some of the modes that can propagate in the star can be more complex modes, where you can have like you know, dipolar and quadrupolar and higher order modes with like different L and Ns, you know, coefficients like quantum coefficients. Um, and by studying the, the exact mixture and how it evolves over time, you can actually do what's called astro seismology. So you can literally probe, you know, the like the internal structure of the star, because you know what what propagates and everything depends on the composition, but also the way that the star you know is built up. You know in terms of layers. So some people, like in Leiden, for instance, is a big group doing astrocytic seismology, and they look at like the, the luminosity variations of stars, and they they work out like you know like to uh, immense details like how the structure of the star is. Um, so that's like sound. You know like light turned into sound. Okay, here is here is a quiz for you. Here's a sound. And you have to tell me what you think it is. Can you hear it? Is it loud enough? Yeah. Quite regular. Uh -huh. A little tic tac. Okay. Mini, mini, clue. Tic tac. Like a 
radio a radio pulsar? Yeah. I mean, I'm a pulsar astronomer, so who's <laughs> saying <laughs> that's going to about some pulsar today? <laughs> yeah, so uh, this, is, this was a pulsar. Uh, so pulsars, uh, as you probably know, they're neutron stars, so they're very compact objects, about 10 to 15 kilometers in radius, but they contain something like one and a half times the mass of the sun, so very compact object, where essentially a, a, a dice, you know, a sort of one by one cubic centimeter, uh, weighs something like you know an entire mountain or or the equivalent of the entire world's population in terms of weight, you know, could fit in one dice of a pulsar, uh, one cubic centimeter, and they they uh, they are very bright, especially in the radio regime. Uh, not because it's the star itself emitting light, because the, the surface of the star tends to be hot, like at a, a few you know, even hundreds of thousands of kelvins, but uh, uh, it's a very small object. And so as you know, the luminosity of an object is proportional to the temperature, but also to the surface area. So because they're so tiny, low luminosity. But the light is actually produced by a process that's non-thermal. So that's what I'm, I'll be, I need to learn about, you know, to teach in two years' time. Uh, so syn called synchrotron radiation. So you basically have electrons, uh, or other, or, or you know, positrons, and um, they, they are around the star, and uh, the star has a huge magnetic field. We're talking about something like 10 to the 12 gauss. So, uh, or in Tesla, that'd be what, like 10 to the 7 gauss, uh, Tesla, uh, if I recall, so one, one for 10 to the 5, if I recall. Um, so, and the Earth's magnetic field is about half a gauss. Okay, so astronomers they tend to work in CGS for knowing reasons and stuff like that. Uh, so, half a gauss is the Earth's magnetic field, and the uh, a pulsar would have a 10 to the 12 gauss magnetic field. And uh, the most magnetized regular stars that we know of, there may be like maybe one kilo gauss. Okay, so that gives you an, an idea. Uh, so, highly magnetized, uh, predominantly dipolar magnetic field. And so the electrons are trapped in the magnetic field. You know, if they have a transverse motion, they'll just go along the magnetic field lines. But they, if they have like you know just a tilt in the other direction, then they, they, they go in one direction. And then because of Lorentz force, right, they'll get redirected. And then essentially, if you have a field line like this, and you send a particle that's charged like this, it should start spinning around the, the field, right? So that's just Lorentz force for you. And so, uh, and as it does so, it's accelerated, right? If you go in a circle, you have a centrifugal or cent centripetal acceleration. And what you probably have learned, or maybe not yet, is that if you accelerate a particle, either linearly or you know, with a, an arc, if it's accelerated, it produces light. So that's basically the, the, the underlying principle of synchrotron radiation. So you have these particles, and they basically spiral in the magnetic field and, and as they do so, they go really fast, close to the speed of light, and they produce radio light. And there's like a particular kind of like spot that we call the polar caps, where the field lines, um, you know, when they wrap around the star, they cannot wrap around because the, the extent to which they go would make them go faster than the speed of light. So these field lines, they remain open. And that's what we call the, the polar cap of the star. Mm -hmm. And these particles that like escape through the polar cap, basically, that's where most of the radiation that produces the cold is produced. And, and so you have an object that's a bit like a lighthouse, and it spins. And if you're lucky, that cone crosses your, your, your line of sight. And then you, you hear a blink, or, or you see you know, a blink of light, in, uh, of radio light. So uh, what's on the left? Um, are there music aficionados here? Yeah, Joy Division, right? Um, so that's the uh, that's the cover album uh, from I think the album came out in nineteen like I want to say sixty nine or seventy maybe it was a bit later but when you know it was a band from Manchester and uh, they had heard about the discovery of pulsars and they basically phoned down a job and bank to ask like oh you know we'd like to use that for our album and they, because they had seen this in a paper in a newspaper or something. So each line is basically a pulse from the pulsar, and they've been stacked on top of each other. Um, so that, that's what it is. And here's another one. Um, this one is called O329. Uh, it's in fact the, 
bright, one of the brightest, uh, or actually even the brightest, I think, pulsar in the northern hemisphere. Um, and the, the period of rotation is about, um, is just short of a, of a, or just about a second. So you can kind of, sometimes it's a bit fainter, but like now it's louder. And you, you can actually hear, right, in the sound that sometimes it's not a single peak, but there are kind of like two peaks or a bit of structure. Sometimes it's like, and some, some other times it's just like too sharp. And that's because the whole structure that you see on the right with the red line is when the, each uh, sound you hear, it changes over time. Uh, so that's the structure, but the period between them is very constant. So a lot of the pulsar science is actually about timing these TikToks, and, um, and you can do a lot, uh, you know, that would be another talk entirely, but you can basically do that like as accurately as atomic clocks in some, in, in some cases. Uh, but the actual pulse, they change in shape. But the thing is, when you average, you know, let's say five minutes worth of pulses, it produces a characteristic imprint, like a characteristic average pulse. And that average pulse tends to be very, very stable over time. So if you average like five minutes now or 10 minutes, you know, to get a really high signal to noise, and then you look back at the pulse hour like in six months or in a year, and you average again five, 10 minutes, it, the imprint will look very, very, very similar. But from one single pulse to another, the imprint is very variable. And so that tells us that there's a lot of, um, you know, space weather or like phenomena going on at the emission that shapes it, which um, on average, you know, averages out to something quite, quite, uh, quite stable. Here's the, um, uh, the crab pulsar, right? Very famous, if not the most famous of the pulsars. Its rotation is like 33 rotations a second or 33 uh, millisecond spin period. Uh, so it's located right at the center of the crab nebula. Uh, where the, the arrow is pointing, there's a little, like, it's not easy to see on the image, but there, there are two little points and one is actually the pulsar. And if you could take like very fast imaging, you would actually see the optical star blinking 33 times per second. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the crab pulsar observed at Jodo Bank looks like this, out of the Lovell telescope, you know, the big, big telescope. You know why? I mean, why don't we hear like a tick, 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 tick that we heard on the previous audio? Yeah. Mention the angle of the incident. Yeah. The no, no, because I mean, it's the same pulsar as you know. So this. This is the sound of the crap pulsar, right? So it's the same pulsar. But that's, you know, straight out of the telescope at Jodo Bank. Yes? Maybe because of the space debris, the construction of the space debris? Nope. No. So it's actually, I mean, it, it's actually a lot simpler than what you, you, you seem to think. Uh, so pulsars are actually, I mean, they're very regular, and some are very bright, like the one I showed before, you know, which had like the 0329, these giant pulsars. But most pulsars actually are very, very faint. Okay, so. Even with like the Lovell telescope, which is you know the sort of like fourth largest I think these days in the world, uh, you, you 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 know if you take the raw signal out of the telescope and you plug it to a speaker, which is basically what this was, you won't hear it and you won't see the the, the pulse. So you have every so often, right? If you look at about like twenty three and a half seconds and twenty five and a half, you have like a spike there. It's not noise, you know. It's not like a um, random noise. It's actually one of the pulses from the pulsar, but you only see out of the you know that, that sort of fat sort of like noise stream, you only see a handful of single pulses that are extremely bright. It's because the crab pulsar has this regular you know beat at 33 millisecond period, mm -hmm. but every so often some of the pulse you know they're different shapes, but every so often. They're very, very, very bright, as in like thousands of times brighter or hundreds of times brighter than the regular ones. And so these ones are bright enough to make their way kind of like above the above the noise, to kind of like be seen or heard individually. But the other ones, they're whole, they're all hidden in the noise. 
So the way we observe pulsars right, is using very clever techniques. So that's what the average pulse of the crab pulsar looks like. So you, you've learned, you know, if you've done it labs and or you, you took my data science course or whatever, you've you've learned that if you have a random time series, right, Gaussian noise in the time series, it's it's just completely unpredictable, right? I mean that's what the definition of random is. So if you take you know a, a stretch of time series and you take another stretch of a time series, right, and you average them together, like you know, pixel by pixel kind of thing, they will they will kind of average up, right? And the more you stack, the more they will average, and the closer to zero with like the less amplitude of that variety, right? So basically, if you have Gaussian noise, right, with a standard deviation of one, and then you combine two data points together, right, then the new standard deviation of the new point, right, or the new series that's made like that by combining two Gaussian point with a standard deviation of one, would be 1 over root 2, right? And that's the standard deviation of the mean, right? And then if you combine like 10 points, your noise will go down by a factor of root 10, right? Mm -hmm. But if there's something that's periodic in the signal, right, and you, you clip your data, right, and you stack them at exactly so that the, the, you know, the, the stretch of data that you keep adding up, right, pixel by pixel, are phased up, right, at exactly the period of the thing that repeats. Well, the thing that repeats is a real signal, so it doesn't occur in random phases, it always occurs <coughs> at the same phase, but the, the noise that's superimposed, that one will cancel out. Okay, so as you stack more and more of the data, like I had shown um, earlier, right, in, the, in that joy division, you know, stack plot, if you stack them, the noise will kind of like go down, but the signal will go up, and eventually you'll see your, your pulse. So when we look for pulsars, with like a Java bank or elsewhere, we take a really long data stream, and we basically Fourier transform it to see what the periodicity is, and then once we've established the periodicity, like the crab, we don't even need to do that, we know what the periodicity is, we take that long data stream, and we refold it on itself at the period, and that's why, you know, that's where we see the signal, okay? So it means that, in, like, we can see very, very, very faint pulsars where, you know, the noise of a single pulse might be, you know, thousands of times smaller than the actual data noise, but just by stacking a lot of it, you can actually see it, okay? So that's the power of, like, for analysis. Okay, two more, and then we'll switch topic. Um, here's one called um, 1822. So it's just short of 0.8 second period. And then a very fast one, 0437. So 437, I mean 5.5 milliseconds, so that's something like 180 hertz or something probably in that region. Uh, you know, at that sort of frequency, it becomes an audible frequency. You don't hear each, you know, beat that's part of it. So obviously, you know, when I do pulsar research, I don't convert everything into noise, you know, sound, because that's just very annoying. But you can if you want. Uh, something else that's pretty cool is uh, we often find pulsars in other <coughs> clusters. Uh, this one's called 47 Talk. It's got like, um, I don't know, 20 odd pulsars. Um, there's another one that we're, um, that we're um, observing a lot these days. Where it's called, uh, with a telescope called Meerkat. And we're now at something like uh, 60 odd pulsars in the same cluster. <laughs> and, um, and so in this one, they basically took the sound of each pulsar, right? They, and they turned it into a bit of an orchestra. And then we'll do a flyby. And then wh whichever pulsars are nearer to us, they'll be louder. So you'll see kind of how it would sound if somehow you, you, you could navigate through. And the other thing is, it varies the amplitude you know, of the sound from, from each of them, but also it, it incorporates Doppler effect, right? So when we kind of go towards one of them, the frequency increases, and when we go away, the frequency decreases. Um, so yeah, it's kind of cool, but here it's just, you know, for show, 
But actually, we can use the same principle actually to map out globular clusters because the, the pulsars that lie within, they, um, you know, they're subjected to the gravitational potential of the cluster, which is locally a lot stronger than the galactic potential. So pulsars in these clusters, they orbit, right? And go sometimes with a very eccentric orbit and go like right in and out. Obviously, we don't see any of the orbit. It's, the time scales are too long. But what you see is basically just a, a pulsar that's kind of like as projected to, to you is say behind the cluster and it falls towards it or goes away from it and then or might be at the forefront and also goes you know in or out so uh, you can see that because you can the, the beat of the pulsar which is normally constant and actually in, in theory slows down over time in a very like monotonic way uh, you can actually see that there's some extra like Doppler effect basically affecting the signal so the tick tock gets a bit faster over time or a bit slower because the pulsar accelerates towards or away from you. So you can actually map the velocity of the pulsar. And then you can use another property of the light that basically the light doesn't come at the same time at all frequencies, which is called the dispersion effect. And it's a bit like, you know, dielectric dispersion, if you want, you know, where you have like a, you know, a coefficient of, um, of, uh, diffract, of, of refraction in a medium, but that, that, fra that coefficient is different for different frequencies. So you can use that to measure the column density of, um, of um, ionized material in the line of sight. And be because they're basically at the same distance, right, in the cluster from us, like let's say a few kiloparsecs, but the, the only difference between them is just like the local, you know, the local bits, right? Most of the weights essentially the same interstellar space, but only the local bit is different between them. Mm -hmm. You can tell the ones that have a bit more, they'll be a bit further than the other ones. So we can end up mapping in 3D, you know, their speed and their kind of like their location, if they're behind or in, or, or in front of the cluster. And with that, you can make a sort of like 3D map, and then you can then put a model for your cluster for the stars. And what you find is that usually you need an intermediate mass black hole, like, you know, 10,000 solar mass or something to account for the, the gravitational properties of the, of the cluster. So that's like a way to measure black hole masses, you know, giant black hole masses. Okay, other quiz. Cosmic hum. Where is this one? you would put like you know uh, these white noise and whatnot noise uh, apps you know to fall asleep so if you're a really keen astronomer you can use that <laughs> okay any clue what it might be my cosmic microwave background oh wow we got a winner that was not that long okay so that was easy yeah so it's a cosmic microwave background so uh you've probably heard about it so you know our universe a big bang was really tiny expanded and as it expanded, it, cool, it started cooling down, right? And eventually, the, the sort of ambient temperature of the universe um, got down to somewhere around 10,000 degrees. And what, what's special around 10,000 degrees? What happens then? Yeah, you get a formation of atoms. Yeah, formation of, well, not atoms, not quite. Yeah. Close, but it's not atoms. Well, yeah. We get uh, or, Genesis. Hmm? Genesis. Uh, yeah, no, biogenesis, so formation of like, you know, hydrogen versus helium, lithium and such takes place in the few fractions of seconds oh. after the Big Bang. But later on, it's connected to atoms. I mean, what makes an atom an atom? It's like, yeah. Uh, is it like the electrons? Joined? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So electrons, right? So at really high temperature, um, atoms are ionized, right? Mm -hmm. And when you cool it down, then they become neutral. So at 10,000 degrees or so is when basically hydrogen switches from being ionized to being neutral, roughly. And hydrogen is basically the most abundant element of the universe. So roughly around that time, you go from a, a universe which was completely ionized to a universe that's neutral. And what happens is that, well, it's connected actually to these stellar pulsations I was talking about earlier. So what happens is that when, um, if you have uh, ionized hydrogen, uh, you have like a really, a really big uh, cross section, you know, with, uh, with uh, two photons.
because the photons will get absorbed. You know, hydrogen keeps recombining, basically, and then the photons have enough energy to ionize it. So it keeps like combining and ionizing and everything. So a photon travels, but doesn't have a long main free path. It gets absorbed, right, or scatters, if you want, and then scatters and goes in a different direction. So the universe is like a fog, you know, at that point. You cannot see very far because the photon emitting something from an object or whatever would, you know, it would scatter in all directions. So mm -hmm. you lose sight of what you're looking. But then when it becomes uh, neutral, then what, what the idea is that the, the, the energy of photons right, become low enough so that it doesn't ionize hydrogen anymore. So therefore, light can just travel through. And so around, around that time, it's basically the mean free path of photons becomes comparable to like the size of the, of the you know, current universe. And so then you can see through. So that's basically where you have like, you know, your fog and the fog is lifted. And then you can see, you know, between you and, and where the fog forms. So that's basically what the CMB is. And, uh, and then because our universe expands, then um, that sort of 10,000 degrees or so has been shifted, you know, through the expansion of the universe, has been diluted. So our universe cooled down, and so that sort of 10,000 degrees has now turned into like a 2.7 degrees, you know, on these days. And so that's the temperature of the uh, of the universe, basically. So because, like, you know, when you talk about the black body and like, you know, lecture, you know, and thermodynamics or, or like physics lecture, you always talk about the black body and the perfect black body is some kind of a box where right? and you trap energy in it and you make just a, this tiny, tiny hole and like, you know, sort of one photon at a time can escape and has been completely thermalized and all of that so that the properties of, of which would be a perfect black body, you know, according to Planck and such. Well, our universe was pretty much as close as possible to that, you know, perfect black box where you kind of let the photons escape very gradually. And so um, the, 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 uh, the cosmic microwave background, you know, spectrum looks like as close to a black body as you can ever find. Um, however, it's not a perfect constant temperature. So on this 2.7 degree kind of like fog, you know, temp, uh, that you have everywhere, uh, there are actual uh, uh, like uh, sort of fluctuations and they're at the scale of about one part in 100,000. So that, this means these fluctuations correspond to fluctuations in temperature of 18 micro Kelvin, okay? So you need to, to see these, you basically need to measure the, you know, the black body of the, of the CMB, you know, by observing at multiple wavelengths. And then you need to basically measure enough that can tell like a little shift in that black body, right? Imagine the spectrum by 18 micro Kelvin, you know, using, you know, think of like, you know, plotting the, the, the Planck, you know, spectrum, and then you plot it, but with a different temperature of like 18 micro Kelvin different, and then you make two measurements and you kind of like end up measuring the, that difference, okay? So very difficult, <laughs> but we do it, and we do it extremely well. So this image was made with, uh, for this, this little uh, satellite, Planck, and uh, Manchester, actually, we were very much involved with it. We designed some of the uh, of the low frequency receivers on Planck mm -hmm. that made the measurements. So the different receivers to observe at different wavelengths to characterize the blood body. And so we were part of that. And also this part of the analysis team that's here. And uh, we measure cosmological parameters and all that. So it's uh, you know really amazing, uh, amazing work. Uh, so that is the sum again. Okay, uh, these fluctuations, right, they're basically caused by different parts of the universe which were at different densities, you know, at the time of the CMB. So if you think, if you have like a, a you know, a clump of, of matter, right, that was denser, then um, uh, it was probably lower temperature, and it might started, you know, letting light through a bit earlier than something that was higher temperature. So you can, basically these uh, fluctuations in temperature they trace essentially the density of the universe at that time, the, the fluctuation and fluctuations in density, and these fluctuation in densities they just like kept growing over time, or they you know things clump more, and then this is what led to the formation of structures in the universe like galaxies. Later on, 
they, this sort of continued. So imagine you see, well, it's in blue, very uh, pale color, so it's not easy to see. But you'll start seeing a bit later, hopefully. Um, it does show here. <laughs> um, mm. Yeah, so when you have galaxies that form, right, eventually uh, these galaxies start having stars shining. Right? And so the universe is neutral, but then once the galaxies start forming uh, stars, these stars ionize the, 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 the matter that's around. And so our universe started becoming, um, becoming um, ionized again. And these form bubbles that extended and started colliding. So um, you, can, you can also track the location of these galaxies or these bubbles of ionized material. You can trace them by observing neutral hydrogen that's redshifted. And that's one of the big goals of the square kilometer array. But the other thing is that the, 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 um, the galaxies themselves in space, even though they look all randomly distributed, uh, if you look at, um, and I'll, I'll show it again on the, on the next diagram, so if you look at the typical separation between pairs of galaxies, it turns out that pairs of galaxies like that are at a given redshift or a given distance you know, in the universe, these pairs of galaxies, they're not at just random you know, distance. Because normally, if they were completely random, and you take every possible pair, and you look at their distance, right, and you were to make an histogram, if it was completely random, it would just be a flat line, right? Because they're kind of everywhere, in all directions, at all distances. But it turns out that when you look at pairs, a lot of pairs would be at small separations, because they're basically gravitationally bound. But then it, it falls off. And eventually, you have a peak. So there's like, at a certain scale, you have more galaxies that are at that sort of typical distance. And then once you increase the distance again, then there's fewer galaxies that are kind of at that sort of separation. And this is because of what we call the baryonic acoustic oscillations. So our universe, again, was like a tambourine, you know, initially. Like you have like a, you know, a, a sort of like space with some density. And then you have perturbations in it, right? Gravitational perturbations collapses into um, into galaxies, and when they do so, right, it produces waves, literally acoustic waves, like in the pure sense of acoustic waves. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it, well, you see, you don't hear it, right? Because space is so like the density is so small that I mean, it doesn't carry any sound, but it's diluted. But especially in the early days, on you know, this these waves, they really compressed. You know, space or, or, or extended it uh, like a, the, the plasma in space. And so, and then these, these waves, they also collided, right? So, the typical scale of the original fluctuations that there were in the universe, right, they basically remain there. You know, it's like as if you have a drum, right, and you, you kind of excite the drum at a particular frequency, right, and you have a pattern, you know, a, a vibration pattern on the drum, then that remains there, right? If you if you stop ex exciting it, I mean, it might taper off over time, right? But the the same vibration will continue at the, with the same modes, okay? So what happens is then you take that that vibration and then you stretch it through you know expansion of the universe. So then the typical modes they are now be you know. Doppler shifted basically in, in terms of frequency. So if you can trace this bump at various stages of the universe's expansion or history by looking at like the typical distance in between galaxies at different redshifts, right, which basically tracks the distance, then you can sort of trace. You essentially end up with a, a perfect, well, maybe not perfect, but you know that's what people debate. But you basically end up with a tracer of the typical scale size of that fundamental mode, if you want, of vibration of, the, of our universe. And you can trace that typical scale as a function of redshift. Okay? So the redshift basically gives you like, the expansion velocity right, of the universe. And then the mode itself, right, the, the peak, gives you the scale size. So it basically traces like the scale of the universe. Because if the universe has expanded by a factor of two, 
the peak will shift to be at an angular size by a factor of two different. Okay? So it just becomes like supernova cosmology, where you measure the distance and redshift of supernovae, and you can trace the expansion of the universe, but you do it with a completely different tracer. So you can trace a universe's expansion as a function of time. And then you can take your favorite cosmological model, right, and then see if it fits. And the, the really interesting thing is that it seems to agree quite well with like CMB, for instance, work. But when you look at like uh, supernova or other means, sometimes they don't agree. And then, you know, you start to wonder, okay, do we understand what we think we understand properly and this and that. So you want to make measurements in many different ways to make sure that, uh, that you, you, know, you understand uh, cosmology properly and you get the right conclusions. Okay, uh, second to last, I think. It's a sequence of multiple things of the same class, and each of them sound kind of sound like Merger. Merger. Mergers. Mergers. Well, it could have been maybe, but no. It's what we call fast radio bursts. So it's also something that here in Manchester we're quite uh, involved with, uh, and I've worked on some of it as well. Uh, so there are millisecond duration, right? What you heard was real time, it was not like condensed or, or expanded, it was like real, sort of real time. Um, flashes that you detect in radio waves. So we detected some with a jello band as well, the <coughs> double telescope. Uh, when I prepared the, the, the slides, uh, like last summer, uh, there were 604 of these unique, like, <coughs> that were detected. Uh, the number is probably different now. There's a catalog online, you can go and check and you know, it gets updated every so often. Uh, of these 604, 23 only were seen from exactly the same spot of the sky with the same, I won't get into the details, but the, the same um, dispersion as we call, so we know it's the same uh, kind of object or whatever that produces them. Okay, so 23 of them repeat. All the other ones that we've seen, there been a one-off event, didn't repeat, are they going to repeat one day? Maybe, or maybe they don't repeat. Uh, if they never repeat, it might be because the thing that causes them, right, is a one-off event type of thing. Like if you think of a, a supernova, for instance, that you observe in optical, right, you see a flash of light, and a supernova is slowish, right? The flash gets bright and it fades, and usually you see it a couple of weeks and it decrees, you know, it goes away. But if you take gamma ray bursts, for instance, that you might have heard, which are typically caused by either hypernovae, like really big stars exploding, mm -hmm. or double neutron star mergers. Mm -hmm. um, they usually last about a second or so, and they obviously never repeat, because you have, say, two neutron stars that merge into a black hole, and so it won't repeat again, obviously, because you know that's a one, one way, <laughs> one way even. Uh, so yeah, very big mystery. We don't really know what they are. I mean, there's probably almost as many theories to what they are as the number of of individual events we've observed, right? And any theorist has their, an observer as their favorite explanation. I mean, there are some decent explanations. I mean, some is that they might be connected to gamma ray bursts, for instance. They might be connected to the, the, like binary mergers of like neutron stars. Uh, some say that they might be connected to maybe yeah, some sort of um, hypernovae or some kind of like big star explosion. Uh, they might also be caused by magnetars, like, you know, very young, extremely magnetized pulsars in their very early days uh, mm -hmm. that could produce, like, giant, essentially, pulses of light, maybe only a few or maybe just one, uh, and then they kind of slow down and turn into regular pulsars. So there's various theories. I won't get into uh, much of that, but they're really interesting objects, uh, and we observe them with, yeah, like I said, John Wall has found a few. Uh, uh, Meerkat is the telescope that you see at the top. It's the one I use, actually, I missed the Telecon at an international collaboration meeting this afternoon, like now, which I'm missing to do with you, but um, <laughs> where we talk about our, our research. 
And our research is on pulsars, the one I'm involved with, but there's a team working on actually uh, Ben Stappers, who's another, another professor at, at JVCA, uh, work in the leads, like some of that work. And uh, it's an interferometer, so there's like, um, yeah, there's a, a 64 antennae uh, of about 15 meters, and they form like images and such and work in unison, but Ben has installed a system that can process the data fast enough to look for these bursts. Uh, there's also Chime. Uh, it looks like nothing. It's like two giant parabolids, uh, paraboloids, um, in uh, not too far from Vancouver in Canada, in, the, in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. um, they're um, they're basically um, um, it's like a hundred meter telescope, basically. So uh, each one of them is like twenty five meter long, and it's got an arc that makes it. Uh, I think it's twenty meters or so. Um, so it's like a dish, but that's like cylindrical. Uh, which means the beam it forms to see in the sky, instead of being like a kind of like a, a spot, it's like a fan beam. Um, so it's kind of like the I like to think of it as like the eye of Sauron or something that like kind of like scans the sky because it's fixed on the ground, but the Earth rotates, right? So that beam scans different bits of the sky every day, um, and then it, by using um, like across. You can sort of see this kind of like something that looks like a catwalk at the top, you know, in the middle where the focus is. And it actually, you can walk there, it's a bit of a catwalk, but also um, every meter or so, there's like a dipole antenna, right? Every meter or so. And so this forms also like its own little interferometer. And then you can phase them together so that the telescope can form um, like core and beam within that big eye of Sauron. So within, within that big beam, that's about like maybe like a degree or so wide and covers like essentially the entire sky, you can form digitally by giving different phasing of the voltages you measure, you can form mini beams that are more sensitive because they're like currently added. And you can tie it and then you can localize the stuff you observe. So they have that and they essentially um, observe like the entire sky multiple times a day. And most of the FRBs, like the, out of the 600, like they've probably detected 95% of all of them because they just like own sky all the time and see mm -hmm. like a large patch of the sky. Whereas with you know, a telescope like the Lovell, the patch of the sky you see is basically like the size of the full moon. So you need to kind of you know, wait for a long time to see as many as if you had like something that's about four times wider than the moon but covers like the entire sky, right? Like from one horizon to the other. So, uh, so very exciting. It's actually quite cheap, you know, by this mo modern standard, like that telescope. And one of the primary missions actually of that telescope is to observe these uh, acoustic oscillations, it turns out, that I was talking about before. But it can also burst. So it's really faint. So these are kind of like images, if you want, of the burst. Um, so what's special about them is that uh, they're highly dispersed. So as I said earlier, light that comes to us from space, actually the signal doesn't come all at the same time at all frequencies. So if you have something that's short enough in time, you see the delay as a function of frequency, despite space is ionized. And the more of the ionized medium you have, the more a delay you have. So the curvature of the that signal, the function of frequency, tells you how much ionized space there is. And um, you can actually use it as a, a bit of a cosmic ruler for ionized matter because our galaxy contributes only a small, you know, the so far, the far away galaxy, uh, galaxies. So our local galaxy contributes only maybe 10% of the, of the, of the sweep. And the rest is the, the medium between us and the other galaxy. So, uh, so you can even do cosmology with these, uh, these uh, sources. So that's also why beyond the mystery of their origin, you can do a lot of physics. Okay, uh, I think last one is this. Oh. Oh. The microwave in my house. <laughs> 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 it's just that. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's just that. Um, <coughs> 
when, when fast radio bursts were first discovered, uh, people also found some other kind of like signal that were swept and kind of looked a bit or sounded a bit like the fast radio bursts. But eventually someone realized that most of them actually were coming from that telescope in parks. And they were mostly produced around midday every day and sort of like six o'clock at night, which is when the staff, you know, and astronomers were going to heat up their lunch. And it turns out that microwave ovens, not all of them, but it's a specific, it's not even a brand, it's, um, you know, the, it's, a, it's a magnetron, right? Mm -hmm. the, like the big, super powerful magnet that's in it. Uh, so there's only a handful of companies that produce them actually. And then, you know, whatever microwave you buy, you know, makes the case for the actual thing. There's only a couple of companies that produces them. And there's a particular kind that when you, uh, you when it stops, um, then I guess this kind, it's a bit probably like a capacitor. So there's kind of like still residual current mm -hmm. and it kind of like dies off, if that makes sense. And um, and I guess there's some kind of accelerated magnet or whatever, and so that produces radio waves, basically. Uh, a small amount, I mean, there's nothing dangerous about it, but you know, if you have a telescope that can you know, detect things at, like the micro Jensky, well, then you're gonna detect it. So they, yeah, so it's just like a fun thing. Okay, space time rubble, that's the real last, last thing. Exciting, especially for you because you're you know, just sort of like on the verge of maybe starting a career in research and such, where we are observing our universe not only with electromagnetic radiation but also with gravitational waves, and also we already started, you know, with neut um, with, um, with neutrinos as well, you know, through like you know neutrino detectors. In the next generation of neutrino detectors, they'll be so powerful that they'll also detect like several neutrinos from events. Um, so that's what we call multi-messenger astrophysics. And so, for instance, if you take two black holes and you make them merge, they produce a lot of ripples in space-time called gravitational waves. And these waves, they travel out and they literally distort right space-time as they travel. And so when, uh, you know, they have two big black holes, they merge, and the waves travels at the speed of light, by the way, uh, goes through the Earth, it changes space-time, so the Earth kind of looks like that, you know, wiggles. Obviously, that's exaggerated, right? Um, by how much, how, how big is a typical gravitational wave? Like, how much does it wiggle things? Atomic scale. Atomic scale, it's even smaller than that, right? So the, the typical amplitude of wiggles is about uh, a ta a one ten ta one t uh, sorry ten to the minus eighteen meters, right? So that's the strain we call. So it's like it's like a ten one ten thousand or so of a of a of a of a, uh, of a proton size. Okay, so it's like really tiny, but because we have such great lasers these days and we're really good at doing interferometry or Michelson interferometer, we can actually measure it. So this is. One of the two LIGO detectors, uh, I think this one is the one that's in Louisiana, and there's also one that's located in, uh, in Washington State, so two different places in the US. So in the big building, they basically make a big laser, and very powerful, they split it with some kind of dichroic and send it in two different directions that are perpendicular to one another, mm -hmm. and then they pump, right, they make a vacuum so there's no you know, pressure waves or, or changes in the in the, um, the, the density that will affect you know, the light and everything, so very, very stable. At the end, you put a mirror, and then it bounces the laser back, and it comes back to the original point, and then some of it will bounce back, but also it will go through, basically, and then the two, the two signals from the two arms right, will come back, will interfere with one another, and then you see an interference pattern. So that's a Michelson interferometer, I mean, sort of almost like A-level physics. Uh, and you know that, the path length difference right, will change the interference pattern, right? will make them interfere constructively or destructively. So if anything changes the path lengths, this will change the pattern. And that's basically the principle. And so 
when this is the 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 the, the, uh, the, the very first light bulb edition, uh, which was basically uh, uh, two black holes, each of them about 30 times the mass of the sun that collided, and they, they were located in a galaxy about 1.4 billion light years away from us. And so the plot that you see, um, so there are, there are two things. So the plot that's like a, the actual line shows you essentially the amplitude of the vibration or the, the amplitude of the path difference, if you want, as a function of time. Right? And you can see if there's just noise, it would just be like you know white noise. If there's something that oscillates, right, you would you would see a sinusoidal pattern. So you can see that the path length starts oscillating and that the oscillation becomes stronger and stronger, right, larger amplitude, but also the frequency of which becomes faster and faster and eventually kind of stops and dies fairly abruptly. So what's going on there is that, and I'll try to pause it, yeah, just like this. What's going on is that the gravitational waves are basically emitted at the frequency of the orbit, or at the period of the orbit, or twice, you know, uh, sort of, it's either the frequency or twice or half, right? It's always, it's always half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it beats with the orbit. And as the, you know, and the amplitude, right, the strength of these gravitational waves depends on the orbital separation. And actually, it's quite a strong function of the separation. It's something like this, the separation to the fourth power. So when they're far, almost nothing, and then eventually the two black holes get closer and closer, and when they get closer, they get closer faster because they lose more and more energy through gravitational wave radiation, which drains energy away from the system. So they get closer and closer, and that gets faster and faster. And so the orbit shrinks, and so as the, as the waves are produced, you know, connected with the period of the orbit, well, that pattern essentially tells you about the orbital period, and then the orbital period shrinks, so that pattern gets condensed at a higher frequency. And, but then the amplitude increases because of the separation being closed and therefore more energy produced. And then eventually they merge, and when they merge, well, the black hole forms and it sort of relaxes, you know, this blob of space-time, and eventually it kind of, and then gets no hair, right, and like all slick and everything, and the waves stop. So, that's what you see there. So there's a lot of physics like you can do with basically like literally measuring with a ruler the period and you can determine the period of the, the system. And then the, the change in frequency over time is what the color scale there tells you. Okay? So the frequency you know goes from about like 30 or so hertz up to about like you know the 500 or so. Uh, and the, that sweep in frequency like this, we call it a chirp signal basically. Mm -hmm. And that chirp, the way you know, it, it changes, uh, tells you about like the total mass in the system. So it's a, it's like, it's a bit like a reduced mass, if you want, but for gravitational waves. Okay, so, um, so it's a combination of the two masses. And then you can use other tools to kind of like constrain each of the masses. Um, they detected the same event at the two locations at the same time, basically. So therefore, you know, they were convinced it was a real thing. Uh, but the, the system is so sensitive that airplanes actually create gravitational waves or, you know, and people walking and such. Like if we produce, you know, like waves, actual like vibration waves, but also like the moon and all these things, they produce also gravitational waves. So it's a real, like because they change position, in the, you know, so they, they change the gravitational field. So it's an absolute, very difficult problem to do. And so the mirrors are damped, right? They're damped by uh, the mirrors themselves. They, they are um, hanging with like rope systems that have like, you know, a bit like pendulum. And the rope is hanging on another, uh, on a pendulum and hanging on another pendulum on another one kind of thing. So multiple damping like mechanisms that tend to reduce all their high frequency stuff, basically. So the raw signal obviously doesn't look like that. The raw signal is like a real mess. But the raw signal is very, um, is very red noise dominated. So like low frequency stuff can make its way through. <coughs> but all the higher frequency stuff is really highly filtered, like very efficiently. And that they make it such that in the window of frequencies where the waves should happen, 
the damping is like you know at, at, at its best basically so you can they have like the, the cleanest signal but then they need to correct for all kinds of things so apparently tumbleweeds are also like an issue in washington state yeah so it's it's pretty crazy um so um yeah so they use that that correlation of signal here's the second biggest event we've detected so far in terms of importance the first one was two black holes colliding but this was the first double neutron star colliding and that one was 130 million years uh, away from us you can see the signal building from the start but but um you know neutron stars they're much smaller objects much lighter than these two heavy black holes so the time scale for the orbit to you know start shrinking and then until it gets really close and they merge is very different from that of the two black holes because the period is smaller uh, so yeah so very you know much more subtle signal that lasts something like you know 20 ish seconds what was really exciting about it is that when it happened uh, the Fermi uh, and Swift telescopes, they observed gamma ray bursts in the sky at exactly the same time. And sure enough, like when they observed it, they could locate it. Fermi can lo locate and, and, and Swift pretty well within like degrees. They observed with optical telescopes and they found a, what looks a bit like a supernova. Um, so, um, um, and this is basically uh, the optical counterpart of the, the gamma ray bursts, uh, but also um, it happened exactly at the same time as the, this event from LIGO. So we know now that yeah, these gamma ray bursts that have been observed, the ones that we call the short gamma ray bursts, short duration gamma ray bursts, they're produced by double neutron stars, and now it's been confirmed with like, the LIGO um, telescope. So really exciting. But the problem is you only have two interferometers. So with only one interferometer, if you trust that the signal you detect is a real one, well, that tells you only, um, essentially, it's sort of like a cos theta kind of thing, right? So the, the signal that goes through, um, it will produce the largest amplitude if it travels in the plane that's perpendicular to the plane of the, of the interferometer. Now, if it comes at an angle, right, because of the direction of the, the interferometer compared to the source, it will produce a, a signal that will be kind of attenuated by like kind of like cos theta. Mm. So if you have two detectors at two different places on Earth because of the curvature, and also you can angle them differently, uh, well, on the ground, um, then you can actually start you know triangulating with the two. So it reduces the space, and usually it makes a, some kind of like large distorted ellipse in the sky of like sort of confidence where you, where it is. But that's a border of like sort of you know. 10,000 square degrees or, or 5,000 square degrees, which is sort of like a third of the visible sky from you know that, that point. So it's like not very helpful because there's there might be like you know the odds that something go varies in the sky, and that patch of, of sky is quite high. Um, so now um, I think India is building a detector. I think Australia as well, and I think the, the Japanese as well, and maybe China will also uh, get in. So there's a bunch of other detectors, and I think the the next one to come online will be, I think, the Indian one. Uh, they bought, I think, they got spare parts, basically, like the, from the LIGO. They made like, you know, a couple of extras, and I think they bought that, so they're kind of making a duplicate. And there's actually one in Italy that's called Virgo, but it's a smaller one, so it's not as sensitive. But it's already been operating for a while. So when all of these operate together, then hopefully the region of the sky that they can triangulate for events will also shrink massively and get, give you a localization you know down to maybe degrees in a couple of years so that will also help like the the, the optical monitoring uh, so yeah so hopefully you know we have we're building optical telescopes with like wide field of views to track these events as well and get the optical counterpart so it's really exciting uh exciting and uh yeah manchester is also involved with some of that so uh yeah so hopefully uh, I skipped that, but um, yeah, I'll just play it. Uh, I think it's so cool. Um, so, exoplanets, um, you can turn the, uh, you can turn like the, uh, the transits of exoplanets in front of their stars into sound. So basically, um, you know, Trappist one you probably heard of. It's got. Uh, is it like seven planets? One, two, three, four, five, six. 
you know, seven planets. All of them are about like Earth size type of thing. And um, yeah, so they, uh, they basically, uh, some people in Toronto, they turn, they turn the signal into, uh, into like a, essentially some like music. Uh, and so when you have the data stream, right, because the planet passes in front of the star, it creates a tiny dip of like sort of one person or less in the light of the star. So you have like, if you have only one planet, well, it just makes a dip and it's at a regular interval. But sometimes when you have multiple planets, then it becomes really messy because you have all these dips and then you need to find, you know, these dips, like which matches which other one. Uh, but yeah, so, um, so they've been able to do that with Kepler and then observe with like a bunch of other telescopes. So it's really exciting. Um, and then um, it turns out, right, that in that system, the orbital periods are like basically in harmonic ratio. So if you look at the first, the inner planet, and the second one, it's an eight to five um, like orbit. Then if you look at the second to the third, it's five three, then three two, three two, four three, three two. And it's because they're more stable um, orbits when they're at like harmonic, you know, um, scales. Um, so it's kind of cool because they are also at harmonic scales. It means when they orbit, you know, if you look at the orbit from above, then they kind of like all meet up like in a single line, you know, at, at sort of regular interval. And so then you have all these beats, then you have like three and they beat like that. And then I think they'll add maybe a couple ones. Um, yeah, so it's really, uh, really neat stuff. Um, so I'll just play. So basically they play a, a note every time there's a transit. And then they'll start adding the next one. And they gave them a tone that's like proportional to the orbital period. System-sounds.com. So it's uh, people. Uh, I think it's the Matt Russo. Actually, he's a former graduate of uh, the SRM department there. If I recall that sim. And then the other two are other people. But yeah, really neat thing you can do with the, with the data. So when the you know when the drum and the sim symbols and stuff kicked in, that's when like the alignments were created, right? So um, they've got other sounds, but I think that's by far like their best, like the really neat stuff. But go go check them out. Yeah. Okay. I'll stop there. Thanks so much.